Good afternoon, everybody. Oh, thank you very much. Welcome to this month's Brown Bag Lunch Program. I'm Jarrett, and I'm the curator here at the Amelia Island Museum of History. Thank you so much for coming out to learn about the life and times of Gregor McGregor. And before our event begins tonight, I'd like to ask everybody to please silence or turn off your cell phones so we don't interrupt our wonderful speaker as he's talking. Now before we uh, dive into today's lecture, I do a few announcements about our upcoming programs and events we have here happening at the museum. June's third on third lecture will explore the music and musicians that make up the Sunshine State's uh, historic soundtrack. Join us as we learn from Gary McKechnie, a National Geographic author and travel journalist, as he tells us about Florida's pop musical history, from Ray Charles to Tom Petty. This presentation will also celebrate the opening of our newest exhibit, Voices of Amelia, which explores the local musicians and melodies that have made an impact here on our island. Please join us on June 21st at 6 p.m. for an evening you won't want to miss. Next month's Brown Bag Lunch will be presented by Regan Duran, who you may know as another one of our talented volunteer docents that guide our guests through the museum twice a day. The presentation will explore the immediate successor of Gregor McGregor in our Eight Flags story, The Pirates. Mr. Mrs. Duran will guide us through the brief but infamous period of privateer control over Fernandina and the story of their leader, Louis Aurie. This story is unlike any other in Fernandina's or Florida's history, so make sure to join us on July 5th at noon. Finally, I have the honor of introducing today's guest speaker. Mr. Chip Kirkpatrick is a longtime docent with the museum, guiding our guests through the story of Amelia Island every single week. He's a frequent speaker around Nassau County on a wide variety of historical subjects, and is also dedicated to investigating the history that lies beneath our feet through his prolific metal detecting services. Today, he's joined us to share his knowledge about Fernandina's infamous Scotsman. So without further delay, please join me in welcoming Chip Kirkpatrick. I want to thank y'all for coming, but I'm curious, where are all the brown bags? Can y'all? <laughs> Dr. Mello? Uh, before I start, I want to give a little public service announcement. Uh, the city of Jacksonville this coming Saturday from 9 until 12 at Ed Austin Park is holding a children's book event. Uh, They're going to be giving away books to children and uh, book bags and so forth. Uh, Forty different authors, uh, including me, uh, have donated books to be given to them and they're also going to have books for sale. So uh, if you know somebody who likes to read, send them out there, let them get some free reading material uh, and they'll have a great time. Now. When Jarrett announced that he wanted the docents, and if you don't know what a docent is, by the way, it means we docent get paid. Um, <laughs> but when he announced that he wanted us to do these presentations on the eight flags, I jumped to get this up. Because whenever I give one of my tours, this is everybody's favorite part. And quite frankly, it's my favorite part too. Uh, I'm going to start off here with a little quote. Oop, there we go. Good girls go to heaven, bad girls go everywhere, according to Mae West, but also do, so do bad boys. I have a bit of an affinity for Gregor McGregor, and it's because in uh, 1969, or as my son describes it, when dinosaurs were still roaming the earth, uh, a friend of mine gave me a book to read called Flashman by a gentleman by the name of uh, George McDonald Frazier. Frazier's written a number of historical uh, fiction and non-fictional books. He actually wrote the screenplay for two of the James Bond movies, but he uh, wrote a book called Flashman that was his best work and it burned into like a dozen in the series. Uh, the book is about a character by the name of Flashman. If you read jo uh, Tom Brown's uh, Schoolboy Days, uh, by Thomas Hughes, which talks about what it was like being a student at the rugby school. One of the characters in that book was named Flashman. He was the school bully. And he was a scoundrel, a cheat, uh, and a thief, and a drunkard. Uh, eventually he was expelled from rugby for drunkenness, went home to his father who didn't want him there, and his father bought him his colors, which was the term they used for buying a rank in the army. And he became a lieutenant, got married, 
but there was a scandal, and he was sent to India, where he arrived just in time for the Sepoy mutiny. Sepoy was the term for the native soldiers there. Uh, and anyway, it, he writes these books, and they were absolutely, this is where my interest in history began, because these books are absolutely accurate, footnoted and everything, and Frazier and I actually became pen pals for a period of time, because I couldn't believe he wasn't a historian, but he wasn't, but he just loved doing research. Uh, but these books put him in all kinds of places throughout the history of that time, some of the major and minor uh, conflicts. He was uh, at the Boxer Re uh, Rebellion at Insan Dawala with the Zulus. Uh, he was at, at Appomattox fighting for both the Union and the Confederacy. Uh, he survived the big, Little Big Horn, and he became friends and adversaries with a number of historical features. And these books are just beautiful, and I fell in love with the character. And so whenever I heard about Gregor McGregor, well, and those are some of the books there, Flashman was fiction, but McGregor was real. And you're going to see a great deal of uh, similarities between the two people. Now, Gregor was born in uh, December 24th, 1786. Scottish family, not wealthy, but comfortable. At the age of 16, which was the youngest age you could join the English army, he convinces his family to buy him the rank of an ensign in the 57th Regiment of Foot. After a year, he was promoted to lieutenant, which was pretty quick, but don't forget the Napoleonic Wars were going on. And they always said that the fastest way to get advanced was to have a war, because when somebody got killed, you got moved up. Uh, the regiment was sent to Gibraltar to defend a, against a possible French invasion, which never happened. And he spent his time there drinking. Uh, in 1804, he meets Maria Bowater. She's very wealthy because she is the daughter of an admiral and related to two generals and a member of parliament. Against the family's uh, objections, they got wedded in 1805. And two months later, he purchases a captaincy for 900 pounds. In 1809, McGregor was serving with the 8th Lion Battalion of the Portuguese Army with the rank of major. However, in 1810, a minor disagreement with a superior officer escalates to the point to where he decides to leave the army, and he sells back his rank, and uh, the money that he re receives back from that will soon be his only source of income. Uh, oops. Okay, yeah. In 1811, the regiment's actions at Albiro would earn the, uh, the unit much prestige, and earning them the name the diehards. And he often bragged about being a member of them, even though he had left long before they ever earned their reputation. You're going to find this guy was quite a blowhard. Uh, the 23-year-old McGregor and his wife moved to England, where he now starts pr to present himself as Colonel McGregor. And not only that, he begins introducing himself as Sir McGregor, claiming uh, the McGregor clan chieftain title. He also claims family ties with various <coughs> dukes, earls, and barons to create an air of respectability within the London uh, society. Effortlessly, they enter into England society and are welcomed into the ranks of the wealthy, the titled, and royalty. McGregor realizes that with no quick or easy way to confirm or deny any of his claims, that he can pretty much represent himself any way he wants. And he can say anything about himself, and who can say not? And this will serve him rather well in the rest of his life. Uh, in 1811, uh, his wife dies. And now her family cuts off his income. And he's pretty much without any kind of money coming in. His only experience or training is military. But returning to the English army would be awkward and embarrassing. So he looks for other opportunities. And he looks at the opportunities in South America where there is open revolt against the Spanish. In 1812, he travels to Venezuela and presents himself to General Miranda, who is heading up the revolution. He uh, joins the, he 
represents himself as being a former colonel in the English Army. Uh, he is welcomed. He's made a colonel and put in charge of the cavalry. Uh, and he quickly is promoted to general and then commander-in-chief. Wow. He serves the next four years operating against the Spanish on behalf of Venezuela and the neighboring New Granada. His only real action during this time was a fighting retreat from the Spanish army through northern Venezuela in 1816. Remember, he was running away. Uh, but he is hailed as a national hero for this. <laughs> Miranda is captured and imprisoned, and Simon Bolivar is now in charge. And McGregor marries Bolivar's favorite cousin and becomes part of the family. Hey, if there's an easy way to get ahead, this guy was looking for it. Uh, but McGregor begins to believe that Bolivar is not so much trying to liberate his country as he's carving himself out a little kingdom. And he wants one too. And he hears about this crazy island off the coast of Florida where there appear to be no laws. And he thinks, that's my kind of place. <laughs> he goes and meets with some wealthy South Carolina businessmen and convinces them to finance an army for him. But he can only raise 50 men. One of those men is very eager to come to Amelia Island because he's got family and business here to tend to. And he tells them, you go ahead of the rest of us and spread the word I'm coming with an army of a thousand men. And he does, and soon the Spanish out of the fort hear about it. McGregor lands his ship out of sight of the fort. He and his 50 men begin slogging their way across the marsh towards it. And they soon run into our Florida mosquitoes. <laughs> and it's hard to fire a musket and swap mosquitoes at the same time. But there is a weed that grows here called dog fennel. And the juice of it is an insecticide. You crush it and you rub it on your skin, but you don't put it on your face because it's poisonous. So what they would do is they would cut sprigs of it and put it in their hats just above their faces. And it looks like feathers. And only officers were allowed to decorate their hats with feathers. So the lookout at the fort sees what appears to be 50 officers coming towards them. And if there's 50 officers, there's got to be a thousand men. And so they raise the white flag and surrender the island without a shot. <laughs> He raises the Green Cross of Florida, our fifth flag, and establishes the Republic of Florida. He sends men down to the harbor to notify the captains of all the ships anchored there. There's a 16.5% tariff on everything they're carrying. And the money comes rolling in. And apparently we're rolling out too, because pretty soon he's bright. And he does something quite despicable. Amelia Island had always been a haven for escaped and runaway slaves. He gathers 31 of them together, sells them back into slavery for the money. He does not pay his investors nor his men, and half of his men desert. Yep. The word is spread that the Spanish are returning in great numbers to retake the island, and in the middle of the night, McGregor lowers his flag and departs Amelia Island. He returns to South America and rejoins Bolivar. In 1819, he oversaw two calamitous campaigns uh, in New Granada. In both operations, he would take land, but instead of building defenses in case the enemy attacked, he spends his time drinking, and so do his men. Both campaigns result in vicious attacks by the Spanish, catching his British volunteers ill-prepared. And both times, he abandons his men, one time by jumping out of a window, and flees. His men are captured and executed. Quite a hero. Because of his cowardice, Boulevard declares McGregor to be an enemy of the state and orders his immediate execution if captured. And he returns to England. But he returns in style. 
Among the titles that he claims is His Serene Highness Gregor El General McGregor. And who can prove him wrong? He comes claiming to be a prince or Kazik of a newly founded country in South America called Poets. And he is commissioned to find investors and to sell land for English and Scottish settlers to immigrate and become citizens. Poyas was land given to him by King George Frederick Augustus of the Mosquito Coast. What happened was he got him drunk and suggested that he give him some land so that he could bring investors in and he's given 15 million acres of absolutely useless land. Uh, it's covered with thick forest of commercially useless trees and thick underbrush. The natives are hostile and the ground is poor. And that shows you where it was located. Yep. McGregor goes to England and he has these beautiful maps and brochures drawn up. And he runs ads in all the papers promoting an opportunity for investors. And he describes the land as perpetual summer. There's no insects, there's no disease. The natives are friendly, they speak English, they love the English. There's a modern new city for everybody to live in. The ground is so rich that you can raise three crops a year. The forests are full of teak, and you just pick gold up off the ground. And a number of banks and large corporations begin to invest heavily, but more so, bunch of people start buying land with the intention of going down there to live. <coughs> and he is greeted and welcomed back into England's society and he is honored with parties and banquets where many uh, future investors line up to meet him, make inquiries and purchase and complete the sales. He is given two 200,000 200, pound bonds to finance his ventures with no collateral whatsoever. Uh, and he's also given free use of a large country estate, because after all, he's royalty and he should be comfortable while he's here, right? A number of banks and large corporations invest heavily, and a number of people start buying land to go down there and live. And remember, this was right after the end of the Napoleonic Wars, and England is basically broke. And the people there are looking for any kind of an investment that they can get a profit off of, or someplace to go for a fresh new start. And this sounds too good to be true. Unfortunately, it was. Soon there is a ship with 250 Scottish and English settlers getting ready to set sail to start their new life. He goes down to the harbor to see him off. And as a final act of kindness, agrees to exchange their English and Scottish money for the currency of his imaginary <laughs> I mean, he had everything. He had money printed up. Bills of sale, I mean, it was done really, really well. Okay, whoops. The seas are violent, and most of the passengers suffer badly from seasickness on the 50-day journey to their new home. The ship was to travel to a certain point where a pilot boat will then guide them to their final uh, resting place. But when they arrive, there's nobody to meet them. They anchor up, and after a couple days, they start firing their cannon to let the natives know they have arrived. <laughs> <laughs> but the only people that show up is a second ship of settlers. After a couple days, they start unloading their possessions onto the beach, and they send the captains out to try and find the spot they were supposed to go to. And a terrible storm comes in, washes most of their possessions out to sea, and they're stranded. And within a year, two thirds of them are dead. They're stranded and quickly learn the paradise that they uh, plan to live in is not as promised. The land is hostile, the jungle impenetrable, and the ground is poor. And worst of all, it's not called the Mosquito Coast for nothing. In fact, they don't even get to the beach before they're being attacked by swarms of mosquitoes. And everywhere they went, they were there too. The settlers struggled to survive. 
Food is hard to find. They have little shelter from the sun, heat, and frequent storms. They live in crudely built huts and lean-tos. And the mosquitoes are ever-present and attacking, and infections and diseases start to weaken them. Malaria and yellow fever and other diseases take their toll. Two-thirds of them, over 200 of them, die. Their deaths are caused by malnutrition, malaria, and yellow fever. Meanwhile, the English Navy stops five more ships of settlers from going down there, telling them, there's nothing there. It's all a lie. Go home. <coughs> a rescue ship is sent to rescue the survivors. And the sailors on the ship are sickened by the condition of the people who remain. None of them are healthy. They're all skinny, eaten up with bugs, and many of them have diseases. And the site of the cemetery where those who died and buried really upset them. Meanwhile, McGregor, who profited the equivalent of a billion dollars off the scheme, is living the life of luxury. But word is slowly being leaked about the truth around the magical land of Poyas. And then the first survivors arrive back in England. But word is still slow to be passed, and many people don't believe them. Even though they're this big around and, you know, eaten alive practically, they believe McGregor instead. Come on. Like the stories are not, often not survived in spite of their physical condition and the testimonies of the rescuers. But eventually, McGregor realizes that the public opinion about him is starting to diminish. Come on, there we go. So he takes his show on the road, and he goes to France, and starts over. However, it seems the French are not as gullible. And eventually, he is arrested, charged with fraud, thrown into prison, and awaiting trial. And at his trial, the survivors from Poyes are called to testify. And they testify on his behalf, oh. <laughs> claiming it wasn't his fault their captains didn't know how to navigate properly and took them oh. to the wrong spot. Wow. He is acquitted and released. And he quickly points his finger at his assistants who helped organize these uh, and actually led some of the expeditions. They are harassed and harangued by the public. Several are attacked and beaten by angry crowds. Some of them are charged with the crimes that McGregor committed. And one of them was found guilty and sentenced to prison. McGregor returns to England, and over the next decade, he attempts lesser versions of these schemes and with mixed success. But in 1838, he returns to Venezuela, where he is hailed as a hero. <laughs> he receives his old rank and full back pay. <laughs> Plus, a nice, healthy pension. Wow. And in 1845, he dies in Caracas at the age of 58 and is buried with full military honors. Oh, my God. So you talk about a man who did nothing right and got all the rewards. <laughs> I thank you for your attention. Are there any questions? Yeah, I was curious, uh, how did the residents of Amelia Island find McGregor? How did they feel about him while he was here that brief period? Well, uh, the people that he brought were mainly uh, criminals and uh, pirates. But we seem to like criminals and pirates here. Because remember, we were a land where there really were no laws. And so he was pretty well received, is my understanding of it. Uh, 
So if none of them bought any land from him, I guess they were okay with it. Really. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Um, he married somebody, a second person? Yes. And what happened to her, and did he have any kids? Uh, I don't know about the kids, but as far as I know, I mean, she was, she was with him in England, and she returned with him to Venezuela. Uh, for how long? I didn't read anything on that. Yes? I think he said that uh, England sent ships to rescue the people in Venezuela. In Venezuela? In Poyes. That were starving? Yes. How did they know that they needed to do that? How did England know that? One of the things that they did, those that were healthy enough to do it, uh, kept a fire burning on the beach to notify any ships passing. And apparently uh, caught the attention of one of them. And uh, apparently they didn't have enough room to take them. So they sent another ship back to take care of them. It's a good question. Yes? I've talked to you before about this, but are there any documentation saying that Gray's band was part of the group that came over with this group? I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Gray's gang, they were misfits on Cumberland Island. There's a whole story behind Gray's gang, and they were kind of like the characters you say here, and I, I have some kind of indication they came with the Patriots. Now that, I don't, I've not read it or seen anything about them before, okay. so great, I'd like to know about that. Yes, ma'am. You said that the Indians were hostile in South America? Yes. But I, I did Right. They just, they were led to believe that these people were friendly, spoke English, loved the English, and would help the settlers uh, build their homes, plant their crops, and all that, and apparently none of that happened. Uh, I've not read anything that indicated of any hostilities between them, per se, but they weren't as friendly and with arms open like they were led to believe they would be. Yes, ma'am. Does his gravesite still exist? I'm sure it does because, I mean, he's a national hero. Do they say this is a falling on it? Apparently not. No, because I doubt they even knew anything about it at that time. Uh, <laughs> Communications. Were like they yeah, around. that's the whole point. Because there was, there was no internet, there were no newspapers. That's why he was able to carry off the schemes that he did. You know, representing himself as, as royalty, higher ranks, and all this other stuff. I mean, he was good looking, he was charming, uh, he presented the right picture, and people just fell for it. Yes? How long was he on the island? On Amelia Island? No. Uh, if I remember correctly, something like six months. And that's one guy twice. Uh, not long. Yes? And did he bring the Green Patriots flag with him? Did he yes. This flag? Yes. And he flew that everywhere. Everything. Yeah, that was, quote, his flag. Is there, is there any documentation who they actually were when they came to, to me uh, and occurred to you? You mean as far as names or yes. titles? Uh, I'm not aware of any. I'm not saying there's not. But I, I, what I read was basically they were pirates and, and criminals. Same but, kind of thing I'm saying with Greg. Yeah. Right. Could be. Well, if we don't have any more questions, thank you all so much for coming yeah. out this afternoon. And thank you for your speaker.